Atheist Nomads, episode 411, The Law. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin, and joining me as usual is Lauren. Hello. And of course, the cold Lauren had last week. Ugh. She gave it to me. Yep. I was starting to come down with it as we were recording last yeah, last episode, and then... It was hitting hard when I got to the editing and got the episode out on Saturday. <laughs> Barely got the episode out and Kylie caught it. Of course, yep. we all caught it. You know, that was going to happen. So, yeah. And, and one of the things on it is just with the whole, you know, if you're vaccinated, you don't need to worry about masking. There are still colds out there. Yeah. In fact, I went to the mall today and um, although it's been, what, 10 days now? Yeah. 11 days now for me. I do still have to clear my throat every so often. I still have to blow my nose, you know, once a day. Um, It's a hanger on her. But I was at the mall at doing a thing. I hate the mall, but I went anyway. (laughs) And uh, the woman in the checkout next to me is like, oh, still wearing a mask? Like, she was prepping herself to go into why you need to get vaccinated. You can tell she was gearing herself up. I'm like, actually, I just have a cold and I was protecting, you know, I was just protecting the people around me you know, yeah. pointed at the cashiers and her. And she's like, oh, well, that was considerate. I'm like, I think it definitely needs to be something that we do from now on. Yeah, absolutely. If you've got anything phlegmy, coffee, sneezy that is going to be causing particles, you know, escaping your body, you've got masks now. Mm-hmm. Put them on. Yep. And people will, you know, they may give you a weird look, but that would help decrease the amount of flu and colds that go around by a lot. Right. And also on our last camping trip, we were up in northern Idaho, which, you know, we cover the news enough. They pop, that area pops up in the news enough. The old trope that, you know, northern Idaho is just, you know, that whole panhandle just full of uh, skinheads. Oh, yeah. They claim that they ran them out. Yeah. The Aryan nations that they ran them out. They ran out the organization, not the people. Right. And then that got replaced by all of the <laughs> far right wing racist ass hats from California right. moving up there. My, my mom made a joke when we were leaving um, saying, you know, don't talk politics in, in the rural, rural areas. And you know, wearing a mask is the same thing as doing that there. So especially at this point, especially at the point that the lieutenant yeah. governor took over and said no more masks. Yep. Man, if I had worn a mask to any of those gas stations or something, I ugh, that could have been bad. Well, we went through the drove through the town, well, right by the town that is where she's from. Mhm. White Bird. Yep. Oh, wait, no, no. She's from oh, Eastern no, no. Idaho. It's yeah, no. it's she's the person who's going to be running with falls. her for Gillings. Gillings, yeah, who's going to be running for lieutenant governor to replace her while she tries to become governor. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm on the mend. Kylie's almost there. Dustin's basically over. Almost there. Yeah. So, just in time for us to go on our next camping trip. Yep. So, yeah, wear a mask. (laughs) Wear a mask if you're sick, and if you don't feel safe, wear a mask. Unless you think it might get you shot. Yeah. Yeah. But there's that. Uh... (laughs) So let's get into dusting off the degree. Yeah. We're going to talk about the law. Okay. So are you going to be talking about the Republicans' law and order party? No. We are <laughs> talking about the biblical law. The, the, uh, the original ACAB? All cops are bastards. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, now, when, when we're, we're getting into that, you, of course, have to... We need to talk about what does that even mean? Biblical law? Right. Is this like, I'm assuming that it's like the laws that really uh, super fundamentalist right wing countries instill on their people as a way of control based on some passage in the Bible. As a general rule of thumb, you look at the Jewish, the anglicized version of the Jewish breakdown of what Christians consider the Old Testament. You have the law, the prophets, and the writings. Yeah. The law being the the books of Moses. Okay. With Genesis being just stories, with Exodus being mostly stories, okay, and then a bunch of random laws, and then Leviticus, which is random laws, and then Numbers, which is a few stories, a census, a couple stories, some random laws, 
And then Deuteronomy, which is a contradictory version of retelling all of it. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's a... Uh, the Ten Commandments is the most central piece of the, the Old Testament law. Okay. Okay. The Ten Commandments in Exodus are different from the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's... Okay, so that's where the wording differences will show up. Heck no. The so then you have... Like, whole things are different. It, no, the, 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 the core is the same, but like the rationale on the Fourth Commandment... In Exodus, it's remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy for in six days God created the heavens and the earth and rested on the seventh. In Deuteronomy, it's remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because you were slaves in Egypt and God killed a bunch of people and freed you. Paraphrased. You're not slaves anymore, so enjoy it. You're not slaves anymore, so one day every week you must worship me. So, because that's not what it says, though. It doesn't say, you know, one day of worship. Oh, uh, yeah, it does. Keep it ha- holy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's, and, and there are a bunch of laws on how to keep the Sabbath holy. So to clarify, are you talking, are the, when you say the law, you're talking um, basically Old Testament? Yes. Okay. But you're also going to be talking about those rules that are- There's also stuff that comes in from the prophetic writings in the Old Testament- there's a little bit that comes in from the New Testament, but not much. The main one that comes in from the New Testament, and of course that would only apply to Christians, not to Jews, is... Ignore the Old Testament? Polygamy. <laughs> oh, okay. There's no law... The only laws about polygamy in the Old Testament is you can't marry your wife's daughter, you can't marry your wife's mom, or your wife's sister. Oh, dang. Or... Mormons do it. Yeah. That, those are the rules. Is And in the New Testament, there isn't actually a prohibition on having multiple wives, but there is a prohibition on being a deacon or elder if you have more than one wife. Oh, interesting choice. So you can be a Christian, you just can't hold church office. Okay. <laughs> that seems such an arbitrary line to, you know, draw on the sand, but okay. Yeah. So, but for the... And then there's also a, there's also stuff in the New Testament, the writings of Paul include things about Jesus completing the law, which a lot of, of Protestant Christians view as that means that the Old Testament law doesn't apply at all. Yeah. Because Jesus completed that. It's done. And then you have the more fundamentalist side, which is he completed it by adding in the love stuff by finishing it off right rounding it out not by completing it by like nullifying it yeah okay but huge portions of the so so there's a lot of stuff in the in the the levitical law is another term for it because most of it is contained in the book of leviticus of which still sounds like leviathan to me so every time you say it all i imagine is a giant squid going "Ah!" it's stuff like you can't pick up sticks on the sabbath (laughs) And uh, the infamous mixing of fabrics and mixing of fabrics or boiling a baby goat in its mom's milk bastards or eating the blood with the meat. <laughs> Does that mean you can't have blood stew or blood pudding with meat or you have to actually bleed the animal dry? Oh, oh, like Is that where that comes from. The whole. Yeah. Kosher. Yeah, the kosher rules are oh, I in I thought that they just thought blood sausage was really gross. It was like, nah, we're not going to do that. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> that's their interpretation Every of... Every German is like, no! That's the, the Jewish interpretation of the prohibition of blood and meat. Uh, there's, and also the, to make sure, might as well go ahead and get into it. And Jews as a whole have gone with... If the law says don't do X, we're going to prohibit even more around that to make sure that you don't ever even get close to actually breaking the actual law. No loopholes. So no mixing of dairy and meat in the off chance that you're eating a calf and that cheese that's on that burger is that cow's mom. Or it's come from milk from that cow's mom. So no mixing of those because there's the chance that that would be bad. Wow. That makes the really super strict kosher stuff even more ridiculous. And that's not even particularly strict kosher to not do cheese on and, and meat. Uh, the kosher is the reason why margarine was invented. Because 
you couldn't have butter and meat in the same meal, but margarine isn't dairy. Right. It's made from vegetable oils. So you can have vegetables oh. and meat. So you can oh. put margarine on your steak, but you can't put no butter on your steak. Uh, okay. With margarine, but... Yeah, no, no. Stroganoff would just be out. Yep. You... Unless you went vegetarian on the stroganoff and just did mushroom. Oh, yeah. And so there, you get all kinds of stuff like that. There's also the rules on, you know, like Orthodox Jews have done things like in concentrated areas where they are, they'll put up strings around the neighborhood like on power poles to say everything within the string is in our house so you can definitely travel anywhere in that area even though there are limits in the law as to how far outside of your home you can travel on the sabbath right your neighborhood's your home your city is your home yeah oh uh they do th- yeah, i can say it's like if you're willing to put up string around your neighborhood fine you can't do a whole city, so you're you're pretty limited there. They have entire products on making it so that you aren't doing work on the Sabbath, like phones, where when you push the button, it actually interrupts this signal, not creates any signal. So that way, you're not turning on a switch, because turning on a switch is causing work to be done. And that might be the same as doing you work. You can't even make electrons do work? You can't even make electrons do work, because that could be possibly considered by God as being you doing work on the Sabbath. I remember my, my Mormon grandma saying that you, you shouldn't go out for fast food after church because then you're making somebody work. Like, but that person's working anyway. They probably need the hours. <laughs> How do you justify <laughs> that? They didn't do laundry. The, the, Try not to cook. The I logic understand. on it. But, um, and your grandmother was Mormon. Mm-hmm. So some of that's obviously adapted. The, the logic on that is that even if you aren't doing the work, if you're making somebody else do work, that you are culpable. Oh my God, culpable. is that why buffets are so popular here? Because that... man, you go to the Golden Corral after the Mormon church crowd hits the streets and it is packed. Oh, that's probably the evangelicals. Oh, okay. <laughs> you have to keep in mind, there are more evangelicals and Pentecostals in Boise than Mormons. That's true. But I, I, you know, I'm talking in general with Eastern Idaho. And okay. Like that. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, but, but like casseroles are really popular because yeah. you do all of the work for cooking. And if you're not Jewish and think that it would be a sin to turn on the oven to heat it, then you're, you're fine. Right. The work quote unquote associated with putting something in an oven is far less than actually cooking up a pot roast, which is also a Sunday tradition in a lot of families. That's funny. Yeah. Anyway, I digress. And now I'm thinking about food and I'm not starving, but it's in my head now. Okay. Uh so anyway, so Jews have been very to to be consistent, they have commentaries that create all of these extra steps to either create loopholes or to make sure that you don't even come close to breaking the rules. I don't know which one's more annoying. <laughs> it's, it's all annoying. Can you imagine being yeah. God and you're like, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Knock it off, you guys. Because the, the real fear there is that if they, if they don't, God will smite them. With, say, a pandemic. More like a pogrom. Yeah. I am. Yeah. Uh, a what? Pogrom. Uh, Small-scale genocide? Holy shit. Well, yeah, that is nasty. Uh, the, the Russians were really big on pogroms in the 18th and 19th, you know, 19th and 20th centuries. Um, uh, the Ottomans and then Turkey, after the Ottoman Empire was done, had pogroms against Jews and, and Christians. Um, it's, we're still seeing that with Muslims mostly, but... And, and like, a, a, a lot of Jim Crow was effectively pogroms. Okay. Uh, sorry, is that P-O-L? Pogroms? Pogrom. Pog- like program, but okay. without the R. Oh, man. Okay. And, it, yeah, so basically it's, it's where... It's a curse. It's racially motivated or a recognizable group motivated, mm-hmm. usually Jewish, that a mob goes and tries to harass and kill. And some of the pogroms have been successful enough to completely wipe out the Jewish population in a town. Most weren't that successful, but would scare the rest into leaving. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
the Tulsa riot 100 years ago would be probably one of the closest examples of a pogrom in the U.S. Okay, okay. Where white mobs... Because, yeah, okay. ...murdered thousands of black people and burned down their entire neighborhood. Yeah, that is a good example of what the pogroms were. And when you're talking about the law, you can't not talk about the Roman Catholic Church, especially pre-Reformation Roman Catholic Church. Cause oh, right, because they were the law. That's the most fun, because... <laughs> They had it all worked out into the law was fluid. The only people who could read the Bible were the priests. And so they could, they were the only ones who could interpret. So they told you what the law was. Okay. And dogma was what mattered, which was the combination of scripture and tradition and the edicts of the church. So whatever they say is dogma is dogma. And dogma is all that matters. Also an excellent movie. So basically their system worked out to original sin condemns you to hell. Baptism is the only way out of that. Okay. Which means if in 1450 you were born in Berlin and you were baptized as a baby, you won't be going to hell, most likely. If in 1450 you were born in Constantinople in a Muslim house, you would be going to hell. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. was obviously a little ethnocentric. Yeah, very. Uh, mortal sins existed. Those were things that could send you to hell, even if you've been baptized. Okay. Okay. I was wondering when that came in. So examples of mortal, mortal sins were suicide, apostasy, opposing the Pope. That's really about it. Unless you become a heretic or piss off the Pope enough to get excommunicated or kill yourself. Wow. Wow. You probably haven't committed a mortal sin. Uh, murder is not a mortal sin? Yeah, maybe. Oh, okay. I thought the Ten Commandments were mortal sins. Nope. Okay. Nope. Okay. Not even close. So it really is just, you know, a Hail Mary and you're okay? Well, because with suicide, you're committing murder, which is one of the worst things you can do, and you don't have a chance to do any Hail Marys to undo any of that or to repent the sin. You can't do confession after suicide. Okay. Oh, okay. but if you I commit the logic there, if you commit murder and then you confess that sin, because there, then there's also that element that confession is what makes like all sins are mortal sins to a certain extent, but confession is what makes a mortal sin forgivable. Okay, not forgiven, but it's now no longer a mortal sin. Then they had all the normal sins, <laughs> which resulted in anywhere from thousands to millions of years in purgatory. Uh. Let's not even get into the timeline. With the Crusades to be able to burn off purgatory, like in some cases they were promising, you will completely erase your entire purgatory debt as well as that for your wife and all your children if you just carry the cross into the Holy Land and kill a bunch of brown people. Yeah, that checks uh, out. There was also systems on how much of it, like what, if something was inherently sinful, what were the degrees of sinfulness? And so, like, they had a, like, sex. They had all worked out into the least sinful form of sex. Because, obviously, celibacy is the only truly sin-free option. Right. Original sin is, is basically sex. Yeah. So, procreative sex is the least sinful. But still a little bit. Still a little bit. And sex for fun with your spouse is the next least sinful. Okay. Followed by sex with a prostitute. Okay. Followed by masturbation. That's hilarious. Followed by gay sex. Okay. So, and that's the worst of the worst? Yeah. Okay. The, the el sodomy. And, but yeah, masturbation's worse than prostitution, or adultery. And I don't even know how adultery even really fit in with that. They didn't mention adultery. No. Huh. They also don't mention the differences between the genders. You're a woman who does these things versus a man who does these things. Everything's written for a man's point of view right. anyway. So if you're a woman, you just get stoned and that's the end of it. Most likely, uh, whether a woman goes to heaven or hell is, or how long she's in purgatory is solely dependent on her husband. Right. Which Much like... Why, which is why she sent him into the Crusades. Yeah. <laughs> With the cross. Much like how in, until the, the mid-1980s in the U.S., women could not have, married women could not have their own credit. In pre-Reformation era 
Catholicism, I'm pretty sure women couldn't have their own purgatory credit. Okay. Yeah. Married women. Yeah. Specifically. Yeah. All right. So now let's get into the way a lot of Christians kind of break out the law into categories. Okay. Because if you're going to cherry pick what you're going to follow, you need to have categories to make it easier to figure out what do you cherry pick. You need which you cherries need do you set pick? Set of justification for that. So right. What? What's? Yeah. Okay. So what's the most basic? The most basic is the ceremonial law that all Christians ignore. All Christians uniformly accept, and when I say all Christians uniformly, yeah, I'm sure there's that one weird guy's sect somewhere that doesn't. But you can generally Including say cults. all Christians uniformly view. The law that Jesus fulfilled and ended was the ceremonial law. Okay. And that would be all the... That to most Christians includes all of the stuff around the temple. The temple cleanliness. Okay. So that was the stuff that the, the, the preachers and the priests, they're the ones that had to pay attention to that stuff. No, everybody did. Like, this is where you get into the rules with... You know, how to do sacrifices, but also who can go to the temple. Oh. So including rules like a woman is unclean for seven days, during her entire period and for seven days after that period, because blood is icky, and women are unclean for a month after having a baby boy or two months for a baby girl, because girls are going to menstruate and blood is icky. (laughs) Because girls are icky, is what they're saying. And... Men after, and then there's also this whole thing with after you, your period of uncleanliness, you then have to bathe and wash your clothes. Right. And men having a nocturnal emission have to, are unclean until sundown and have to bathe and wash your clothes. But those were, but those are the laws that people, the ceremonial laws. Those are the ceremonial laws. So, okay. That still affected, that still affects people. That affected me. Yeah. When I had my first wet dream, literally a week after I got, no, it was two weeks after I got baptized. I, I missed the church service after I went baptized. I got baptized because we went to the dunes. The <laughs> next week <laughs> was my first week back in church after getting baptized, and I had my first wet dream Friday night. I woke up, and instead of going in and helping getting the church ready for the service with my parents... uh. I stayed in the car reading the Bible to try to find a loophole for how I wasn't clean and I could go to church. You didn't know about the, uh, the disregard of ceremonial law. What I finally concluded is, realistically, there are probably other men who have gone to church after having wet dreams. Yeah. And I hadn't done laundry, oh, poor but I did take a shower and I changed my clothes. Yeah, I can see as a kid, a young kid who just got baptized, how, how upsetting that would be. And I'd read the Bible, and I made the mistake of starting at the beginning, so I had read all of that. That was still relatively fresh in my mind. Oh, boy. Yeah, nope. Um, So anyway, that's the ceremonial stuff. Uh, Most Jews also reject most of the ceremonial law because it's tied to the temple, and the temple was destroyed. Right, there's no more temple. So synagogues are not temples, they're just... They're assembly places. Right. Um, synagogue is from the Greek synagoge, meaning literally coming together. Hot. Together with, or something like that. Yeah. yeah I'm joking. Um, then there's the dietary laws. Okay. That most Christians reject, with exceptions. None follow all of it. Which is hilarious, because, I mean, if, uh, if you're going to do it, just do it. No. Can't, you can't be that so, easy. So, Adventists follow the... Dietary Laws of Leviticus 11. These are the... You can eat the flesh of mammals who have cloven hooves and chew their cud. So you can't eat horses because they don't have cloven hooves. And you can't eat pigs because they don't chew their cud. Okay. And there's a specific... Cows and goats. Cows, goats, sheep, and a specific reference saying it's okay to eat rabbits. So technically... Even though rabbits don't have... Cloven hooves. Yeah. Or hooves. Technically, that means Seventh-day Adventists should not be eating chicken. Mm. Birds. Okay. Including bats. (laughs) Whoopsie. (laughs) Are in a separate category. Okay. They're also okay. You can eat birds except for raptors and scavengers. 
Okay, that makes sense. And fish, which includes everything in the ocean, you can eat only that which has fins and scales. Right, so no shellfish. And no shark. Oh, okay. But you can eat whale and all the ray fin fish. Whales don't have sh- uh, have uh, scales. scales. Right. Um, huh. And not all of the ray fin fish. Eels would be out. Okay. Oh, that's too bad. Unagi is so good. But, but so is bacon. So that's- Tuna and salmon and... The fish, the fishy fish. Yeah, the fishy fish. Catfish would probably not be in because their skin's not really scaly. Hmm. Um, Sorry, they're not missing much anyway. Yeah. Um, and then I think there's also catfish are definitely out because I think there's also a specific rule on fish, no bottom feeders. The stuff that will make you sick. So the the raptor birds and the scavenger uh-huh. birds and the bottom feeder fish. Pigs that which will eat anything and also carry parasites. Horses were... Most of the stuff makes sense yeah. to a certain level. Right. Horses were Horses were animals. too valuable for work. Yeah. So you don't... Rabbits were plentiful, so eat them. <laughs> and shellfish wouldn't... If you're in the middle of the desert, isn't really going to be safe by the time it gets to you. Yeah. Gross. Uh, that has, as the evangelical and basically everybody who's not Adventist reason for why that doesn't apply, is Acts 10, 9 to 16. Where Peter is supposed to be meeting with a Greek and being a good Jew doesn't want to meet with somebody who's unclean in his house. And so they're, he's, he's, they're, they're heading to the place. He's trying to wrestling with whether or not he should do it. God told him he needed to go meet with this guy, but he feels wrong about it. And then he falls asleep and has a vision. Oh, it was because he was hungry. Yeah. So, so starting with verse 10. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat, but while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. In the story, Peter responded to that by going ahead and meeting with the unclean Greek heathen. He was unclean because of what he ate. He was unclean because he wasn't a Jew. And didn't keep kosher. Okay, okay. What he ate and everything else. So Adventists view this as it was a metaphorical vision about people. Most other Christians view this as it was literal. He would have gone to this person's house and probably been served pork. Until... Don't be a dick, eat it. Don't be a dick, eat it. <laughs> eat a dick. <laughs> <laughs> now, Paul also has writes in a couple places about, you know, regardless of how you choose to eat, if you go to somebody's house and they serve you food, eat whatever they give you, whether it was sacrificed to an idol or not. Okay. Because that was the other part that also kind of reads into Peter's pretty standard Greek practice Every time you cook meat, you are sacrificing it because why not try to get favor of the gods? Uh, yeah, every little every little inch that you can get. You have your little household idol. You're going to always be making sacrifices. Every meal is a part of that process. And if you believe those idols are meaningless, what difference does it make? Yeah. And it's better to not offend your host. Okay. Uh, anyway, most Christians use that to say, you know, you can eat, you can eat pork. Uh, oh, whatever. Adventists say, nope, nope, those rules make sense. Uh, Half of Adventists don't eat meat, so they take it a step further. A minority of Adventists take it even further and are vegan. But there's no biblical reason for that. That's just... That's the... They are being sanctified by God and getting closer and closer to the diet they will eat in heaven, where there will be no death. Okay. Not at all related to the laws. Nope. Okay. Nope. Next. Uh, (laughs) These laws are... Jehovah's Witnesses don't follow Leviticus chapter 11, but they do the no eating blood in Leviticus chapter 12 or 13, which is still part of the dietary rules that Adventists don't follow, but Jehovah's Witnesses do. And that has gone as far as no blood transfusions, because that's consuming blood. That's basically eating it. Yeah. This is where the cherry picking just starts to really show itself. 
Like it just it, we talk about uh, speaking of Pride Month, we talk about it in regards to you know if you're going to condemn this whole group of people for living this particular lifestyle, mm-hmm. but you wear mixed cloth clothing or you ate lobster on your anniversary or something like that, it's like wh- what what's the argument against the nitpicking? Right, because the cherry picking and that that's homosexuality gets mentioned in the Bible twice. Well, okay, three times. Uh, in, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the main references, though, are Leviticus has the prohibition on a man laying with another man like a woman. And then also a case of one of the priests seeing a man coming out of the tent with another man because they just did it and throwing a spear through both of them. Okay. Yikes. Same spear going through both. And then Romans chapter one. Paul's describing the continual fall and depravity of humanity and includes in it men having sex with men and women having sex with women as kind of the final stages of that. Right. That's descriptive, not proscriptive. Okay. Whereas Leviticus is actually proscriptive on it. What do you mean? Uh, Sorry, I do not use the word proscriptive in everyday conversation. Proscriptive is in it's... Not, Telling you what to what to do or not to do, okay, as opposed to just describing the way a things situa- are a situation that makes you feel icky. Yeah. Um, now there are other references to homosexuality. Well, yeah, but that was just an example. Of- and those are all of the holy people of old getting it on with other men, <laughs> being passingly suggesting that they are getting it on with other men, um, such as David and Jonathan. Right. As the most clear example. Um, then there are laws that are purely religious in, in nature. Some separate those out as they guide your relationship with God. Most don't because those are just part of the ceremonial laws. Um, the Sabbath would be an example. And they're not paying attention to those anyway. Right. Huh. So Adventists follow the Sabbath on the same day of the week as the Jews do. Um, Mormons and some Protestants follow the Sabbath on Sunday, even though it's a different day, and follow the, so, some of the rules. Most Protestants? No. Oh. Most don't oh. follow the Sabbath. They they All the Sabbath restrictions are part of oh, the, okay, yeah. the, the, the ceremonial rules and don't apply. Right. Um, And then there's also just civil laws that obviously may be good for guiding interpersonal relationships, but for the most part, they're how a government was being set up to rule a particular people. And we have our own civil laws here, so you don't need to worry about stuff like setting your slave free on the year of Jubilee. Right. As as an example. Yeah. Okay. Christians are all over the place as to how much, if any, they follow. Right. Uh, Most liberal Christians view the Old Testament laws as being completely nullified by Jesus's death on the cross. Evangelicals mostly believe that Jesus's death on the cross nullified the Old Testament laws, except for those icky gays. Except for the icky gays. (laughs) Uh, And the shellfish. No, wait, they don't do that. Then there's fundamentalists who love to pick random verses for various things to come up with reasons why you shouldn't go to the movie theater or dance or... Those are the ones that you see um, stickered on the back of trucks on the back window. Just random. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Often Pentecostals where one of them had a vision while speaking in tongues that this particular verse applied to their community and anybody who doesn't follow it is going to burn in hell. Uh, There's Adventists who say they don't reject any of the biblical law, but they view the civil and uh, ceremonial laws as not being applicable. In other words, they ignored those ones. Yeah. And they picked out Leviticus 11 to follow out of the dietary laws and not the rest of the dietary laws. Yep. Well, that's because you had some prophet or prophetess tell you which ones to pay attention to, right? Yeah, it was was all part of the the health message and the part that they made the most 
you must do this or you're not a good Adventist. And they should have gone full kosher with that, but they didn't. <laughs> right? It's just a big old whatever. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, if you are, you know, foreign Adventist traveling, uh, eating kosher or halal meals is a great way to eat meals that are fine for an Adventist who eats meat. Vice versa. If there's somebody who follows kosher or halal who doesn't know what to eat, ask the uh, local Adventist. Yes. <laughs> Which, when I was on the International Air Cadet Exchange in Britain, um, the Turkish cadets did several times. <laughs> <laughs> like, what could we eat here? I'm like, this one. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Order what I'm ordering, you'll be fine. Uh, because they didn't eat pork. That's almost, that's almost sweet. They didn't eat pork. I didn't eat right. pork. They didn't drink alcohol. I didn't eat, drink alcohol. What are you yeah. drinking now? Alcohol. Yeah, well, I know. Sockeye <laughs> Porter. Very nice. All right, so that, uh, that wraps that up. Okay. All right, in the news, Vietnam has been doing so well with COVID. Like, it was hitting Asia really hard early when we were all still talking about how much worse influenza is. Yeah. How much more of a risk influenza is because we were in the middle of flu season. Right. And coronavirus wasn't here yet. Uh, they did a full country lockdown. Like they were one of the first and they kept COVID from hitting and they've had a few minor outbreaks, but they lock shit down around any outbreak that's happening. And they've been able to keep it under really good control. They've done better than almost anyone. Okay. They got practice with the last coronavirus outbreak, which we called SARS. Right. The bird flus. And also the bird flus, oh. but SARS was not a bird flu. Oh, that's right. That was that was that came shortly after. So I get those. Yeah, two thousand four versus two thousand nine. Yeah, um, yeah. We were technically on SARS CoV two with the two thousand four SARS pandemic or epidemic. Never became a pandemic. Being SARS CoV one. Nice. Yeah. Um, anyway, so they have. A new outbreak that has popped up because of a church. I would say dun, 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 except for it's something that everybody should expect by now. Specifically, a Protestant church mission. Every time. Uh, in response, the country has banned all public gatherings of more than 10 people for two weeks, including all religious gatherings. And... They've also brought ch criminal charges against the couple running this church for, quote, spreading dangerous infectious diseases. Wow. I mean, yeah. This is in Ho Chi Minh City. The rest of the response was to test the entire population of the city. Wow. Okay. That's With a, a capacity of 100,000 tests per day. Wow. They got this. They, they got these plans organized, don't they? Yeah. Um. They had 145 cases pop up tied directly to this one church. Um, they locked down the district in the city around the church and banned all religious events. So they've done, and one of the ways they've done so well is they did that initial nationwide lockdown. And since then, they've been doing a lot of testing, a lot of close monitoring, and a lot of targeted lockdowns. Yeah, which is exactly what we were all calling for for the past year. But and, there was always somebody who was so butthurt about their freedom and liberties that it never got done. Well, we... Plus, we just didn't do the testing because we had bad leadership. We never got the testing capacity in place to be able to do targeted lockdowns. Mm. We could now, but we couldn't before. That took a long time to set up, though. Yeah. Like... Uh, I was involved in helping set up some of the testing in Idaho. We did not have the capacity in Idaho to test asymptomatic people until both we got the mass testing all set up and our really bad third wave ended. Yeah. <laughs> so now there's capacity to test asymptomatic people. There weren't, wasn't before. There's not enough for surveillance testing even now. Yeah. Uh, Vietnam set that up. They also have done, an, because they were able to keep the initial spread from happening, they've been able to do targeted spreads, or targeted lockdowns that they can do because of surveillance testing, because everybody has to get tested periodically. 
Okay, wow. In the U.S., we have done none of those things. Right. Well, of course, we're a much bigger country. Yeah. Ho Chi Minh City, I mean, that's, that's a big city. Nine million people. That's, you know, that's a lot of people. Ho Chi Minh City has more people than Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming combined. Yeah. Wow. In one city. <laughs> this is just insane. Yeah. And, and that really shows that, yeah, when you've got that kind of density, it's a lot easier to do stuff like that. When you don't have the density, like in the Western U.S. Where everybody was just getting in their cars and going on vacation to the next tourist town. <laughs> How would you pull off doing surveillance testing in Yellow Pine? No. Yeah. And, and Yellow Pine used to be the second most difficult place in Idaho to get to. Um, it's still a pain in the ass to get to, and it takes ambulances an hour and a half to get there. Yeah. It's a lot easier when it's just a block away from yeah. everything. Marjorie Taylor Greene just can't shut up. Everybody roll your eyes in unison. She, who has been stripped of all committee assignments. Okay. And banned from even sitting on any committees. Good. Wow. And that was over support for violence against colleagues. Uh, she went on Steve Bannon's Real America's Voice, claiming that vaccine passports are the mark of the beast and that she doesn't believe any of the research around COVID because, quote, that's a bioweapon. So we need to be very clear about what was the intent of COVID-19 and these viruses that they experiment with, like some sort of dark Dr. Frankenstein experiment. I don't buy it because I don't believe in evolution. I don't believe in the type, that type of so-called science. I don't believe in evolution. I believe in God. Okay. Yeah. And that is, that is a symptom of a bigger problem. It's that you've got people who think the science is, you know, it's not um, perfect, but it's something reasonable that you get behind because you're always trying to learn more. And then there's the people who say, but there's this one thing that I don't agree with. And you guys, you know, you scientists are therefore completely invalidated. And they push that into our public schools, et cetera, yeah. and it gets worse. And she's crazy. And it's it's a growing problem because there there was a time where non-overlapping magisteria was a concept that people could get behind. Where pastors talk about religion and scientists talk about science. Yeah. And you don't step on each other's toes. Yeah. That's gone. That, yeah, that went to the wayside a long time ago. But what's funny is, okay, let's assume the incorrect notion that it's a bioweapon. Uh -huh. This was created in Wuhan, that this was either accidentally or on purposely released into the wild. Um, that doesn't change any of the science that's been done since it started to spread. Because all the vaccines were created to still nullify it. All of the research that we've been doing is, it's not based on political pressure. Well, okay, so. That seems crazy reason to not. If you believe that this is a bioweapon from China to attack the United States and make Donald Trump look like a fool so he'd lose the election. That's batshit insane and not based on anything in reality. Yeah. However, that's not the conspiracy. The conspiracy is that this was created at a lab in China by the global elite. So were the vaccines created by the elite. Okay. In other words, Jews. Same people. Oh, God. Oh, that's right. See, I, I totally, like, that. I never make that connection. Yeah. I can't believe people live like that. The Jews got the Chinese to make the virus, so then the Jews got... Does that makes sense. The Jews made vaccines against the virus, and it's all part of giving everybody the mark of the beast. So they get rich and can build a temple? I mean, is that what... I mean, what's going on here? Uh, so that... Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> to foil God's plan, because they killed Jesus. The Jews... Oh my... Oh, what? And I'm done. Yeah. All right. Yeah. People actually think that. Unfortunately. She appears to be one of them. I'm surprised she has not been recalled. <laughs> and, uh, ooh, yeah, she is making an idiot of herself. A Lutheran priest has a TikTok channel that he has suspended. He chose to suspend it. Okay. Um, after a video where he was responding to a 
meme going around of a guy in a jail cell with the caption of when being a Christian becomes illegal. Oh, yeah, okay. And his rant. He rolled up the newspaper and hit the camera. Stop! Stop the whining and the sniveling right now! There are Christians in this world who are oppressed. Yes. There are Christians in North Korea who can't go to worship without risking being thrown into a gulag. There are Christians in Palestine who can't even get to their churches because of Israeli checkpoints and walls. You are not oppressed as a Christian in this country. Quit your sniveling whining. That Savior you claim to serve said, take up your cross and follow him. And you're whining and crying because what? Because nobody's letting you treat gay people like shit anymore? What the hell is wrong with you? Quit whining. Stop it. I, I love the tone of, of bad dog. No, bad dog. Yeah. Which also is uh not does not work. No. <laughs> In traditional dog training, so it's not gonna work here either. But yeah, it's a I it it's it's a power move. Victimize being a victim is mm-hmm. a, can be a very powerful position. So after this message, he was doxxed and then started getting threatening messages sent to his church and some of his church members. Jesus. So he removed some Removed older videos from his channel and stepped away from the platform for a while. Okay. I mean, I, honestly, I wish more people would react that way. And then encourage people to donate to the Trevor Project to support oh. LGBTQ kids. Yeah. Um, which has brought in at least $6,000. Nice. And him at Meta apparently found the doxing and checked this guy out. He refused to comment, but him at did find on Friendly Atheists, he did track down that he is Lutheran, and this is definitely for real. Okay. That his ministry is, this fits with what he normally does at his church. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, and, and completely unrelated, so, no, and semi-related uh, tangent. There was a bakery in, uh, I don't remember where, who was selling rainbow, who put pictures of rainbow cookies on their Facebook page on the 1st of June. And as a result, a uh, customer of theirs canceled their very large order of cookies that they were decor that had they had just finished decorating for the next day. Oh. Canceled the order. So you know, how dare you? And they're like, "Well, if you guys are near us, we have free cookies tomorrow." <laughs> the people who showed up to buy cookies from them and to leave donations was around the block all day long. <laughs> um oh, one lady nice. in utah uh had her, her pride flag torn down and her um locks broken in and uh as the next day when she came home from wherever they were her and her wife and two kids uh their house was plastered with uh rainbow hearts and messages from all their neighbors that's the kind of yeah. wholesome, inspiring stuff that we should be. Moving on, Pastor Florida Man <laughs> has been arrested after a teenage boy found a surveillance camera in the bathroom of the church. Oh, man. This story goes full Florida Man. The teenager picked up the camera after spotting it like midstream and threw it in the trash. Nice. He then told his youth pastor about the camera okay they then called the police the police came retrieved the camera reviewed the footage did confirm that the boy who reported it was captured by it and went back to the earliest where they see the youth pastor putting turning on the camera in the bathroom oh my god he called the cops on himself he 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 was busted i guess he couldn't tell the kid that he wasn't going to call the cops right he couldn't get out of it, so he called the cops, hoping that he wasn't, they wouldn't see that he set it up. Come on, that's the first thing they look for. <laughs> so, he is getting a count of video voy- voyeurism by a person 18 or older, who is responsible for the welfare of a child younger than 16. Yeah. A second degree felony specific for somebody who is responsible for children 
getting busted for doing stuff like voyeurism with adults. I don't know how they didn't charge him with video voyeurism of a minor unless that was a lesser offense. That could be. Being the person in charge of youth could be have been a more yeah. severe charge than the one-off surveilling a youth. But um, what? You're going pee and you just see a camera? Yeah. And obviously, it had been sitting there for a little while. Nobody else questioned that? Been there for a week. No. You know what cameras look like. Yeah. People, it's pretty, if you see one, if you see one in an inappropriate place, yeah, you tear that shit down. <laughs> you don't destroy it. That's very important. You do not destroy it and you do not put it somewhere where somebody can then go and get it and hide it and cover it up. But yeah, you take that down. You report it. You do not talk to anybody else who might want to cover it up, such as, you know, the, the pastor. pastor who was in charge. Oh, my God. You can almost see it in your brain, right? The guy setting up the camera, pushing the button is like, all right. All right. Yeah. All right. There we go. <laughs> it's like, no, dude, you remote control that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Or at least, and actually, if you're trying to set it up in a bathroom, it can be hard with the walls. And if you're trying to catch urinal views, there's, nothing- there's no way you can you can actually turn the on button and not get captured. No, you'd think he would have bought one that's got like a delayed start or something. I don't. There's so many. This was obviously just a a sudden, uh huh. You know, obscene thought. He's just like, hey, I want to see prepubescent willies and adult and adult. Ugh. The kid that, that caught it found it was 14. That's just stupid. You'll find them in hotels and Airbnbs. They're really popular in Ooh. Airbnbs, which, you know, you kind of make sense. Like, oh, well, they, of course, they want to see, make sure that people aren't destroying their property. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't need them in the bedroom with nightlight on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you tear that shit down. Yeah, there's a difference between a security camera, which should be looking at doors, and surveillance cameras... That are looking at you. The nanny cam. Yeah. Suspicious teddy bears. All right. We don't have any new feedback or any new supporters. So if you want to support the show, you can find out how at atheistnomads.com slash donate. If you want to contact us, use the contact form or speak pipe button on the website or send us an email at feedback at atheistnomads.com. Lauren, thank you so much. Thank you. And listeners, remember. Not all those who wander are lost. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.